words like, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And it was two months where I saw that every single day. Okay. Like his grace carried me through that. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode. This week we have Chris and Jen Hadsel. Their stories are incredible. Uh, and I want you to just enjoy this episode. I know that you do already because you wouldn't be watching this if you didn't hit like hit subscribe and do me a favor just leave a comment it helps with the algorithm and it helps get the word out and before we start watching uh, we have an online missions training class that's about to start up there's a link below it's super cheap you can get trained up in missions from your home enjoy this episode with chris and jen hatzel i just told them i was going to tell them what we're talking about but we're not we're going to jump right on in with these guys these are my good friends and leaders of our nicola base yes. in mozambique chris and jen hatzel uh before you just skip because you don't <laughs> you see don't them us. on a uh, yeah I, no I, a, I would skip a huge chunk of our a huge chunk of our listeners are like they're diehards okay. they really are like i am a diehard they're, they're diehards you are yes come I love on it. But then you get a bunch of people that are like, oh, I was hoping, you know. Sure, I get Someone it. that they know. I'm one of those. But I could care less what you're hoping for. <laughs> I, I care more about what you need, and you need today's episode. So uh, uh, hit like, hit subscribe, do do the stuff that you know you need to do that helps us get this out, because we do this free for love. We don't have to do this. We get to do this, and we do this because we love you guys. And my prayer is that you guys get blessed by this, and I know today you're going to. So... I've been told three or four people have been raised from the dead through you guys. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wait, pause and start over again. <laughs> no, 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 I no, think no. we're on the wrong that, podcast. I just want to get people on. No, it, it, let me rewind. Chris and Jen Hatzel. <laughs> Chris and Jen Hatzel. You set the bar really high. And yeah. They're gonna be yeah. <laughs> they lead our Nicola base in Mozambique. It's a new base mm -hmm. uh, south of Pemba, right on the coast. Uh, but you've been with Iris for years. You guys have mm -hmm. been with Iris for years. Um, how are you guys doing? doing great yeah. we're doing really good yeah we're great we're happy to be here thanks for having us come on it's always good to be around you guys um you're in the states right now coming off christmas mm -hmm. yep yeah. and then when do you head back to mozambique thursday yep so yeah fast. so we drive back to atlanta today and tomorrow pack and thursday we're back home awesome yeah how long have you guys been married good oh question. no do the math 13 yeah. years <laughs> Thir 13 this years. will be our 13th year mm -hmm. okay and so just where are you from where are you from okay i'm from atlanta and um, we met in college in Cleveland, Tennessee, so really close to here. Mm -hmm. And I was ready to do missions. I knew I wanted to be a missionary, and Christopher fell in love with me. And I said, mm. do not fall in love with me. It's never going to happen the first time we met. Mm. And you looked at me, and what did you say? I said, good luck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and God, here I sit with three of his children here in the other sits. room. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Well, when you're a hefty man, you have to have confidence. Dude. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good word right there, man. Confidence. Yeah. But I did not want any of it because I knew I was going to be a missionary. I didn't want any baggage. I was going off to save the world, and I didn't want anybody weighing me down. Yeah. So I did a year-long missions trip called the World Race and got to you know did? missions. Mm -hmm. No did way. Back in 2009. So I have multiple friends time. that have done that. I loved it. I loved it. Got to know missions in a bunch of different contexts all over the world. Come on. And then came back, and he was actually on the mission field somewhere else. Where were you, Chris? Cairo, actually. Okay. Yeah, I was in Cairo. Yeah, I uh, I was li we were living. Cle I was living in Cleveland, and I'm originally from Virginia. And it was in Cleveland, and I went through this season of asking the Lord what to do. I spent like three months with my journal laid open, and I was just waiting on the Lord. And on December 14th, 2009, the Lord spoke to me really clearly, and He said, "I'm calling you to um, Muslim peoples in warfare context." Wow, and. I'm the kind of person, like, if the Lord speaks to me. I don't know if you heard that over the microphone. <laughs> that was, that was not, not a, a demon. Whoa. I mean, maybe it was. I don't know if you heard that. It was like a weird was growling noise. Or? Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> this is... Wow. Yeah. So... <laughs> yeah, the demon did not like that It word. didn't like it. And so I'm the kind of person, like, if God speaks, I just go. Which mm -hmm. is not, you know, I just run. And so I bought a ticket the next day to Cairo because I figured that's Muslim. And I can maybe learn some... Arabic and I was trying to get into Sudan and um, I was there for a summer studying Arabic and just seeking the Lord and trying to mm -hmm. figure out where to go and what to do and 
we hadn't spoken in a long time because she was foolishly not wanting to date me. Why? Like, what was know. the foolishness I behind that? I'm just I still don't mission. understand. I don't want any distraction. I need to hear the Lord. I want to hear my calling. And I felt like he was saying he wanted to do missions because he wanted to get married to me. So, I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do. Not a bad. Gotta do what you gotta do. I had like three other okay. guys tell me they dreamed about me and from the Lord before we even met. So Whoa, it was one of those. That sounds like, like a little humble brag. Yeah, I'm just yeah, saying, yeah, I mean, I every time like, she says it, I think I'd like to meet. No, these you guys. just have to like <laughs> put names. your blinders on. Sometimes we went to a Christian college. Yep. You know, everybody's ready to get married. Yeah. So, so I didn't. I don't know. I didn't believe that you really had the calling. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so I. <laughs> and I'd felt the Lord when I was like a kid speak to me about it, right? But yeah. I'd like kind of wandered away and from it. And so I was in Cairo. We hadn't spoken for, I don't know, five or six months. And I got an email from her because she was thirsty for me. And mm. she was like, I heard you in Cairo. What are you doing? She was, she was following up. Did you and say so, she was thirsty? Oh, yeah. For you. She, yeah, she was. <laughs> okay. And so <laughs> she sent this email. And so I just responded. And I was like, okay, well, maybe we should talk about it, right? Yeah. And so we get on, I don't know, Skype at the time. Yeah. And um, she's like, what are you doing? And so I told her what God had spoken to me. And as soon as I did, she started weeping. You know, mm. And she reached out and like, grabbed her journal. And she's flipping through her journal really fast. And she just holds it up to the camera. And it, what it said, it was her journal, and it was December 14th, 2009, and it said, I'm calling you to Muslim peoples in warfare context. Whoa. And same day, same yeah, same, same day, same word. We hadn't spoken in six or seven months. Wow. And the Lord, she's, at that time, I think she was in Israel, and the Lord spoke that to her. I'm in mm-hmm. Cleveland, Tennessee. And I'm at that point like, well, obviously we're getting married. Yeah. You know, that's, <laughs> that was only not, halfway being, through the world right. race. So you're being you disobedient. And totally. So we, uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, you know, might that, as well get used to listening to me, you yeah, know? Yeah. 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 And at so. that point, you know, it was like, okay. And I, you know, and later on that week I was in prayer and the Lord told me, said, I want you to go to Mozambique. And I clearly remember saying, Lord, I don't want to go to South America because I didn't know where Mozambique was. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Can I just, I don't want to cut you off, yeah. but I got invited to South America when I was 17 and I thought it was in Africa. <laughs> the, they wanted me to go to Paris. Paraguay. And I was like, I've always wanted to go to Africa. <laughs> I don't feel best bad about it now. No, don't. And you're Just brilliant too. That makes me feel so good. The American school system. I, right I apologize. Here, no, it was lessons. it was it was the not the failure of the American school system. It was the success of drugs uh, that really brought that on. But 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 I'm, I cut you off. So, yeah, so no, we're geography bros yeah. now. But anyway, I, so I um, but I was like, okay, Lord, I don't know what that means, and um. It was like two weeks later, Jen emailed. I didn't say anything to anyone. And she sent me an email and said, hey, I heard about this school of missions. You should go. You should check it out. It's in Mozambique. Mm. And I was like, well, good enough for me. So I clicked the link, signed up for the school, didn't read a thing. Mm. Had no idea what Iris was. Had never heard of the Bakers. Nothing. And went and the rest is history. Wow. Here so. we are. So years later. How, yeah. you were married for how long before you went to harvest school? I went to harvest school single. Yeah. And then I came back to the States. We dated for two or three months and got married um, not just a few months later. So did you ever go to harvest school? I So after we got married, we did harvest school together. We staffed the married couples after mm-hmm. being married for two months. Yeah, we were ready. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. <laughs> as a right. newlywed, we were staffing and sometimes I was in class. Sometimes we were doing all the admin work and stuff. So that's why I never got my harvest school certificate because yeah. they weren't sure if I was a student or a staff member. Or for what, Pamela's but. watching this. Yeah, so she, she needs to hear <laughs> that. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know what we're talking about, harvest school is our missions training school that historically was in Mozambique, but since the war. Uh, it's now moves moves all around, all right. and there's other ones that we have and spread out through the world uh, as well. You can go to our website and find all that information. Irisglobal. Irisglobal. dot org, <laughs> not dot com. That takes you someplace weird, but I think it's like an insurance place. Never mind. I don't know. <laughs> Come back, Holy Spirit. So you guys are now in Nicola mm-hmm. after all these years. Yeah. So if let me try to give a brief. Uh, overview of what I know. You came to the school, you became missionaries. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in there, you started leading uh, the visitor center Mm -hmm. for Pemba. So you guys, and that's how I got to know you, is I would come, I'd bring teams for Global Awakening, and you guys Mm -hmm. would be there. And you guys hit it out of the park. Yeah. Mm, What took you from uh, leading uh, the visitor center to now serving in a 0.02% Christian population? Mm in the yeah. middle of a war, yeah. uh, planting churches, pioneering a new base. Yeah, we had phased out of the visitor center when um, Cyclone Kenneth came through. Yeah. And we switched over to doing um, relief aid um, up in kind of, I, I call it the red zone because it was very much yeah. like we were doing food drops where like, 
they had attacked the night before kind mm. of thing. And it was just felt like so in our vein. We had a we had a boy that was like basically newborn, and we would take him up to like the staging island, but it wouldn't take him because we're semi wise. Mm-hmm. And so Se- we, semi. You know, <laughs> so, and then COVID hit. We we flew to the states to visit family, and a week later, COVID hit. Got stuck in, in America and stuck for almost a year and a half. Yeah, and so Pema was in transition, and we're praying about okay, Lord, what do you have for us? Yeah. And. So we literally, we went through like, I think it was like five weeks where we had these different ideas throughout the years that have been in our heart from the, we didn't know if it was the Lord or us. Yeah. And we said, okay, this week we're going to pray about this one. We got to Friday and we we're like, mm, that ain't the Lord. Mm. The next one. Yeah. So about five weeks of that, still no idea. And then um, we got a, I, I was praying one day and the Lord spoke to me and he said, uh, he said, you're going to go to Nakala. And I'd never been to Nakala. We were supposed to go on outreach there one time. The government wouldn't let us. It was a weird thing. We got stuck in Nampula. And I was like, that's, that's pretty strange. Uh, I thought we were done with Mozambique, maybe. Mm-hmm. And I said to Jen, I was like, I got this inkling from the Lord. And a couple days later, I felt it again. And I thought, I was like, I don't know. I think God's sending us to Nakala. And two days after that, Heidi sent us a text or a call. I don't remember she called what. us. She called us. And she said, uh, she said, hey, I need to talk to you. Just got done fasting for 40 days. And uh, she's like, you're my first phone call. I got to talk to you. And she gets excited. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. I what thought she told me I was her first phone call. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we're probably second. So, yeah, we were second phone call. And so she said, she said I, I was praying, and I felt the Lord say, you're supposed to go to Nakala and Pioneer Base. Hmm. Will you do it? And I'm looking at Jen like, well, obviously, we're doing it. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, look, yeah, we're doing it. And so we uh, we prayed about it for like a half a day just to be absolutely sure. Yeah. You know? And um, called her back. I was like, yeah, we'll do it. And so we moved there two years ago now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Two years ago to pioneer new work and see what Jesus wants to do in Nakala. Yeah. I mean, and for every metric, it's an unreached people group. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. I think Joshua Project's 0.02%. Okay. Very, very strong Muslim people. Um, they're Makua, which is the same people that we have in Pemba, yeah. but they're Makua Nahara. They're like this little subset tribe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, very, very, very much unreached. So mm-hmm. Bible school, amazing race, not the amazing race. Uh, world race. World race, mm-hmm. gosh. Uh, newly married off the field, going to missions. Don't actually, I mean, you end up in the visitor center, which I, which is a, which isn't most missionaries like, oh, mm-hmm. I want to take care of visitors right. as serve and <laughs> give my Africa life. Africa and serve Westerners, it's different. <laughs> even though the value on that is massive. Mm-hmm. Like you actually get to be there pastoring people as they're in these incredible transformations. Mm-hmm. And then it took, so it took a chunk of time before you actually did what most people would look at as missions, quote unquote. Mm. Right. And I, I disagree with those people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but traditionally, I think the way people perceive it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You did. Yeah. Yep. Right. We did. We did put a caveat when we said we'd accept the visitor center that we could go on outreach every week. Yeah. So we're like, if we're coming to Africa, we definitely want to be able to serve the Mozambicans as well. Yeah. So Harvest School, the missions training school would go every week out into the bush and do discipleship and evangelism, show the Jesus film. Yeah. And that was kind of our one stipulation. Like, we'll spend the majority of the week yeah. <laughs> catering. To but even a lot of that ended up being caring for the visitor. Teams but it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're in the bush teaching people how to use a squatty potty. And mm-hmm. Okay, craziest <laughs> visitor story you've ever heard. Because there's a bunch. I got a ton. But, <laughs> I have you know. So, well, this I one guy so used to leave global awakening trips, yeah. and he was pretty he crazy. Was, he was no. tough. Were you guys there when there was no water, and the team, like, just, we had these squat, these long drop squatty potty things, and mm-hmm. they just didn't know how to use it, and so they just kind of pooped <laughs> around no. the hole in the ground, and I had to go in there and just flick the team's... So. <laughs> No, we did have a visitor one time. Man, are we telling poop stories now? We can tell whatever we want. <laughs> no, no, I won't tell. There, you tell whatever you want. I've fallen in them Welcome, before. Jesus. Yeah. No, we. I don't know. There's so many great. We. I will say this. Yeah. Caveat. Ninety nine point percent of the time, it, visitors were amazing, amazing. wonderful of people. We did love Please, it. But we've also seen a lot of we crazy. Did love it. Yeah, we've had seen a few folks. trials. We've seen some folks and we bought a few you know. bus tickets. But it's amazing to see how God works with people. We had a team come one time that was um, a little bit challenging. Um, and you know, God just has his ways. Mm -hmm. And so this particular team, um, they went on outreach and on the way back, they stopped on the side of the road to go to the bathroom and they got in, um, what do you call it? Um, Those, uh, fire stinging nettles. It's like, it's like those stinging nettles, but like like the African ones that Mm -hmm. are like real mean. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them, you know, went number two in the stinging nettles. So they had, they had stinging nettles from ankles to hips. (laughs) So that was already bad enough. And then they get back on the camion. So it's like this covered truck, mm-hmm. but like with little window thingies. And the driver hit a bee's nest with it. And the bees got in the in the truck. No. And I mean, just. 
and they were with yeah. And so when they got back, it was hopping mad. Yeah, they were hopping. They did not. They did not enjoy. But they got back to no water. They got. Oh yeah, they came back and they were so, so ready for a shower to get off. the nettles off, and there was no water. And yeah, so had to go to the ocean to wash off, and a few of them stepped on urchins. It was. It just was. One yeah, thing it was a another. series. Pemba was full of urchins. <laughs> was I can't tell you how many times I sat there and just pulled. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah things out of people's feet <laughs> it, was it was a series on unfortunate events i think i mean the reason why i love it so much and i think what well, you guys you end up pastoring mm -hmm. westerners it that is. this is their dream and then they get there and yeah. they're like this is a nightmare <laughs> not because yeah, of yeah. Pema, just because they've never been out of the country yeah. Yeah, or no. they expect things to be mm. like all these systems we love our systems yeah and the system is obedience right the mm -hmm. system is we're going after god with everything and it is right. messy yeah and so when you bring people from Mm -hmm. what their idea of what revival or a move of God in an unreached people group looks like. Right. And exactly. they're actually in the middle of it. It is a hot mess. But at the same time, you see people transformed over constantly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It was, it was so, that, that season was so special mm. like, because so many people were coming in at the time. And we, the word that we had from the Lord was that we were pastoring people in a move of God, mm. which sounds weird when you're only seeing them for two weeks. But it was like yeah. everybody, when they got off the plane yep. that first day, our energy level had to be, had to match that, had to be ready. Mm -hmm. Like it was like restarting over and over. Wow. And we would have up to 120 people at a time, yeah. like packed in yep. and trying to like decide, decide, <laughs> discern really quickly where is this person? What do they need? Mm -hmm. Like, how can we serve this guy yep. within this team of 15? And like trying to do that. And we had a wonderful team. Yeah. Like, we we're, we're not, we're just, mm -hmm. you know, we're the donkey that Jesus rides on kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Like it was just, we had an amazing yeah. team that, yeah. that really was able to do that and try to care for the experience of people as they experience mm -hmm. the tough stuff of mm -hmm. Africa, the tough stuff of Mozambique, but also like see and encounter Jesus in that and then yeah. help walk them through some of those conversations. It yeah. was it was a privilege. Uh, it was an unbelievable privilege. Uh, we, I think we still, we'll treasure the rest of our yeah, lives. We love yeah. 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 I, I mean, it, it marked me. I, I, I loved leading teams out there knowing that you guys were, yeah, were thanks. leading the visitor center. I had one of your teams one time. Um, <laughs> Go for went, it. You went with it, but it was a global team. Uh, you might've been leading anyway. So we don't outreach and uh, I had a, while we were doing the, like all the altar time after the preaching, I had a word of knowledge that there was a boy deaf in his right ear. And so I gave the word of knowledge and I see this little hand shoot up. I, I wasn't a boy. I just said, somebody's definitely right here. Lawrence, you know, I saw this little tiny hand shoot up wow. and this little boy comes running through the crowd. And when he, he comes up to me, like your team comes shoot, cause they're ready, right? Like global teams are ready to pray for healing. They are they're ready. ready. Five yeah. step they prayer came models. there. They don't do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And so they come, I feel them coming, you know, and they're, whoop, they, they come around me. And as he walks up to me, cause you know, when you get a word of knowledge, like I've always approached that as like, God's already done it. Right. I got nothing else to do but right. be here. Right. You know? And so he comes running up and he's like tapping his ear, tapping his ear. And I look at him and I was like, Thank you, Jesus, you healed him. He looked at me and his, his ear popped open. He was healed. Come on. And so I was like, Great. So we just move on. And then when we got back to, to the base, the team went, Hey, can we take you to lunch? I was like, Great. I love a free meal. Let's do this. You know? Yeah. And so we go to Little Dolphin restaurant. Yeah, yeah. We're sitting there and they said, Okay, we have to ask, why didn't you do the five step prayer model? <laughs> Stop. Why didn't you they pray? Didn't, they said, why didn't you pray? Yeah. And I was like, why well, didn't, I didn't need to. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, we saw him heal, but why? And I was like, why don't, I was like, it's Jesus anyway. You know, like I was like, once he said the word wow. it's done, like we're just wow. there to watch it. You right. Know? So it was really, it was really cool. And it was a great thing. I think a great moment for them to see that. And I love the five step thing. Of I course. God uses it, yeah. et cetera. 100%, but it yeah. was cool to see like the Holy spirit just explode that box for a second. Yeah. And like open them up to that, and it ended up being really, really cool. But it was it was such a fun conversation yeah. to have with them to like see that God's just going to do what He wants to do. Yes, I mean, we're just here, <laughs> whether you we're know? involved or not. Yeah, right. He don't need me. You know, I'm he just, doesn't. Yeah, he does. But He uses us, right? Mm -hmm. He does. And and in a caller right now, like you guys are seeing people, like we said, in an unreached people group coming to the Lord. Yeah. At a pretty fast mm -hmm. pace. Yeah. Can you talk to me about that? What What's God doing in a call amongst the unreached? Yeah, I think it's really special. The first time we went out, we did a um, an outreach where we brought people down from Pemba and a bunch mm. of solar Bibles. And it was our first outreach in the area, first time Iris had done anything in these villages. They don't know us. They yeah. weren't familiar with kind of our model. We'd done a bunch in Cabo Delgado, so when villages... When Iris comes to villages, people know, but these were people that had no idea. Um, and one of the biggest things we gave them, like buckets and food and things like that, but we had these solar Bibles. So we passed these solar Bibles out, and there was just one guy 
just sometimes you can just tell when the yeah. spirit's on somebody. We passed out the solar Bible and he just always stayed next to us. He was always listening, just so hungry. Mm. He took the solar Bible and then we left. This was a village like two hours away. So we get a call maybe a month later, two months later from this guy. And he said, I am now the pastor of the church. We <laughs> took the solar Bibles. We planted a church. I am now the pastor of the church. Please, will you come disciple us? We're Iris now. We had no <laughs> they, they decided. They no planted, their own. They planted their own church. <laughs> <laughs> we had no. Somehow he got our number. Like it was just. And from that one church, we now have almost 20, 21 churches, yeah. mostly planted through solar Bibles. And honestly, it's a work of the Lord. It Incredible. is a work of the Spirit. They define church. People, people hear church and they go, <laughs> like, let, like, talk yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. These are people who hear from the audio Bibles or hear from their friend groups about Jesus. And a lot of them are meeting under trees. They're meeting in neighbors' houses. Mm-hmm. Some of them have built little <laughs> shade shacks so they yeah. can meet and worship. And, and they're learning and they're trying to just listen to the solar Bibles and do the stuff. And so that's a lot of our work now is trying to figure out how to disciple these people who say, I heard the word, mm. I'm responding to Jesus, mm. but I also don't really know what that means. Please help me. And it's it's a privilege to be able to work, walk through that discipleship in these moments where it feels like God's spirit is just putting himself out there. Wow. Like, like you were saying, we just show up and it's either God does something or he doesn't and he wants to do something. That's why he's in this area. So it's really special to see. And it's, it's mostly through these solar Bibles, which is awesome. We have no church planning strategy. (laughs) (laughs) Went to university. (laughs) Talk (laughs) about degrees for this. What what do you mean? No, we, we, you know, and not that they're bad. We just don't have one. You know, when we first got there, I had someone tell me, they were like, you know, these people don't want Jesus. No one's going to convert. A missionary. A mm-hmm. missionary, yeah. Not another missionary another, told me. Yeah. Yeah. He said, uh, he's, no one here is going to convert. They don't want Jesus. And, you know, I walked away from that meeting very disheartened for him. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I'd been warned those conversations will come. I didn't yeah. think they were real. Oh, they're real. And um, and I, I've watched people, like, love Jesus, like, over and over and over and over. Mm. I think I think I heard Bill Johnson say one time, like, everybody wants a king like Jesus. Yeah. Like, and I think really at the end of the day, that's what they want. And if you can walk in and you can strip away all the religiousness and you can show someone like the pure, true love of Jesus, mm. like, and and the Holy Spirit like makes that fountain kind of come out. Yeah. They can't resist him. I, I don't know how they can. Yeah. And so we just see church after church after, and we're talking like some of these bush churches, man. Like I went to one a couple weeks ago, it was 150 people in a bush church, like just on fire, loving Jesus, wow. like singing the one or two songs they've learned. Yeah. And it's, it's him. And, you know, it's a privilege beyond words to watch him work and that we just get the phone call. Hey, and I mean, literally, like, there's two villages right now waiting on us to get back and go with our team because they got it. They happen to get a solar Bible from someone. Right. I don't know why they're sharing them, but people just keep sharing the yeah, solar. And special. if people don't know what a solar Bible is, yeah, tell I them. encounter this a lot. So I'm going to pull my phone out because it's the easiest. Yeah, thing. yeah. It's about this size, maybe a little smaller. We might even have one around here somewhere. Yeah, they're, they're got a little solar panel in the back. Mm-hmm. And then on the other side, it will have just buttons and a little speaker. And so they can change either from Portuguese, which is national language in Mozambique, to local dialect, for mm. us is Makua. And they can play, they can skip chapters, they can go book by book. And sometimes we're able to add like little teachings at the mm-hmm. end or music or whatever. And we watch time after time after time. Like even back when we were doing the outreach up in the red zone in, in Cabo Delgado during the war, we would give out food, but we would also give out yeah. the solar Bibles. I can't tell you how many people come to the Lord don't mm-hmm. over and over and over. Like and we'd go to villages that hadn't had a food drop, and these are starving yep. people. Yep. Yeah, the hadn't had a food drop everything, in yeah. everything. two months. And we're coming with a food drop, and the first thing they ask me is, because they didn't know what to call it, they would say, radio, do you have a radio? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it would yeah. be this little thing. They'd be like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Like we were on a tiny little island one time, tiny little rock of an island, And it was where people would get away to rest away from the war because it was just far enough off the coast. Is that the island that we were at doing the... No, a little one north of that. And this guy shows up and he goes, I got this a few weeks ago and I believe it. Hmm. And that is happening over and over and over again in Akala now, like where people just get them or... And the cool thing now is some of the people that got them a year and a half ago and are now loving Jesus are now on fire, filled with the Holy Spirit and going out and evangelizing themselves. And it's like the Spirit multiplies himself. Mm. 
Like he's the one doing the multiplication. You know, we have a little guy named Manuel that, you know, he was a staunch Muslim, mm. got saved. You know, some people, when they get saved, they get saved. Yeah. Manuel got saved. Yeah. Like full of the Holy Spirit. And I found out like he's paying his own way to go on the little mini buses out to villages and evangelize and sharing the gospel. He might be 18, yeah. like 17 or 18, just full of fire. Yeah. And it's, I, it's just so, you know, I feel sad to say it. And like in a way, it's like, it's just so easy. Because the pressure, I don't feel the pressure on us to do that. Yeah. Like, it's like the Lord is doing something and we're just joining in what he's already doing. So you said some missionaries came. And I've I experienced that in Nampula, that mm-hmm. same, like, yeah. We, I was trying to go buy a truck in Nampula. So Pemba is where we lived. Mm-hmm. Nampula is six hours south. Right. And Nicola is not too far away from Nampula. Like, yeah. yeah. A couple Three hours, hours east. Yeah, on the coast. Yeah. So we come oh. down, I was looking for a truck, and I, and I ended up connecting with some missionaries. I forget what, what group they're with. It doesn't matter. And they had us, you know, because we're white, you know, so they have us over at their house sure. and we're and we're eating pancakes or something like that. And we're just sharing stories like what you're sharing. Oh, we saw this tribe. We saw this village. We saw. And they're sitting there like. What? <laughs> yeah. What would you what would you and, and not because they weren't incredible, not because right. they didn't yeah. love Jesus. What would you say if you had that guy that sat down with you and said, yeah, they're not hungry for Jesus. What would you what would you tell him? I think I think there's two fault there's two parts. And why is it like that? Yeah. Because the second part of that conversation was I tried to encourage him and I said, Hey man, like I understand that. I was like, but twenty five years ago that's what people said in Pemba. Mm. And we've seen what? Almost a million Makua come to the Lord. I don't even know the number. Yeah, I mean it's right. it's a huge it's number. Huge, Thousands huge of churches. number. And his response was, Yeah, but how do you know they're saved? Are they really saved? And so for him, I probably would respond to it a little differently than someone that didn't add that. I would probably say we, we probably need to check our litmus test for whether or, not, whether or not someone's a believer. Because it's just about faith coming alive in someone's heart. They hear the gospel. They, I'm not even saying they understand the total doctrine of salvation or sin or any yeah. of that. They just know they heard the gospel and they're like, I believe it. I just believe it. Faith came alive in my heart. I believe it. And that's where we land, right? As a ministry, we're like, well, that, that's good enough. Let, let's walk yeah. with that now. You've now said it. Let's walk with it. Now we'll disciple you into all this other stuff. But for other people, like, I think some of it, so much of it is so sovereign. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's so sovereign. And it's absolutely not me or Jennifer. It is sovereign. Mm. And there is a grace on that. And I know there's a frustration on that on a lot of people. But yeah. I find so much liberation in that that God just does what he wants to do Mm -hmm. and I just get to enjoy it, you Mm -hmm. know? And, but I think like from the, from the other side of like, what can we do? I I feel like we just lay ourselves before him and just say what you want to do, do. So what would you say to a missionary that's been on the field 30 years that they've done it, they've done it all well Mm -hmm. as far as what they're told, what they know, they love people. Right, they've done mm-hmm. they've done this for thirty years. I, I used to run in, run into these guys all right. the time, and they're they're serving, they're loving, they're preaching the gospel, but they're not seeing the fruit. What would you tell them? Like, what what would, what would you tell them to change? What would you tell them to to the, shift? The, the first thing I would do is I would tell them thank you. Yes, mm-hmm. I love that about you, Chris, because <laughs> yeah. I agree. I yeah. totally agree. Right. Like that solar Bible yeah. that we have is only there because missionaries went and spent a yeah. hundred years yeah. or whatever, 100%. 50 years. Mm-hmm. Some Wycliffe missionary yep. sat in a Makua village yep. for 20 years until yep. they had it perfect. I love that. Right. I, I yeah. freaking <laughs> love that. And thank probably you, saw no conversion. You know? Yes. You know, yes. Like yes. It's not, yes. It's yeah. I would say thank you for being faithful. Right. Yeah. Because it, and I, there's this problem in, in so many churches where it's about efficacy mm-hmm. over faithfulness mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and all he's asking us is to be faithful right he's the one's going to make it effective like we're just called to be faithful yeah and so for missionaries like that that are exhausted beyond and i get it yeah we've been exhausted it's just thank you for being faithful to what the lord has called you to do thank you for tilling that ground mm. <laughs> <Right>. oh man <laughs> We're getting in trouble. <laughs> Go for it. Man. And it's just like, thank you for planting those <laughs> seeds. You know, like yeah. the word says, like some plant. And it's no lesser of a thing than right. the person like us that gets to walk into Nakala yeah. all these years later and watch the harvest. Like it's like somebody came mm. and yeah. tilled that soil. And it's just, it is such a privilege. Right. And <laughs> so it's, there's a, there's a big thank you there. 
And then also for that person, if there is a hunger for more, mm. like I think, I think that's a whole other thing of like praying and asking God for more and asking for the Holy Spirit to do yeah. something and meet that desire because that desire is going to come from Him. Yeah. But for me, it's just gratitude. What and about, I think what for about us, you, that is kind of the difference with Iris and our movement is that we do believe in the Spirit and we believe that every single day He mm. wants to do something. Mm. And we can just go out with our good church building plan. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But I think for us in the vein that we're in, we feel like God wants to do something every single day. And sometimes it looks like following a plan. And sometimes it looks like laying on the floor for three hours until he speaks. And yeah. then when he speaks, we can move. Yeah. But we do find often, like Chris was saying with that testimony, when we have that word from the Lord and when we have that spirit, it makes it a lot easier because mm. God's already said, this is what I want to do today. Yeah. Instead of me making my plan and trying to do what seems like, Good work. What, what I love about you guys, uh, amongst many things, is you're both highly educated. Wouldn't say highly, but you, you are <laughs> I, I, more than most. I mean, Chris, you you've I know you've put a pause on your doctorate right now, but you're working on your doctorate. Yeah. Um. So you guys have a theological background, right? Mm -hmm. You have you you're very well organized, which I think <laughs> a lot of people look at inner movement. They're like, no, we just want freedom. You know, like, ah. And I'm you know, over here with my spreadsheets. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you, how do you navigate? Because I think you guys navigate the excellence, the organization, the, the head knowledge, mm. as well as the heart knowledge, right? How do you mm. guys navigate that to the point? Cause I think there's a lot of people that get out there, they get frustrated yeah. because they line it up. They, they understand it all and they're going and trying to, they're trying to do what they what they know and and the way that the the way that God's made them, but I, I've watched you guys navigate the tension of mm -hmm. yeah, just your natural giftings, but then at the end of the day, just le letting it go. Has that been hard? Has that been a learning <laughs> process? It's probably to me because I had really strong issues with control. I think I'm high type A personality, very organized, like to be educated. Heidi talks about how she had her notes and quotes, so mm -hmm. I very much resonate with mm -hmm. that. Um, but I do feel like God gifted me in that. But I also received a level of freedom from control that allowed me to release it in a way that I was trusting him and not trusting myself and my organizational skills. Mm. And I think having the spirit helps me discern, okay, is this a moment where we're sitting down and we're doing admin? Because sometimes we do just have to put our head to the plow. Mm -hmm. Or is this a moment where the Lord's saying, come and sit at my feet? And I think it's just... Um, I don't know, getting free from control really helped me. Yeah. <laughs> it really set me free. Wouldn't you say like having, <laughs> being able to yes. lead? <laughs> I mean, we were, like Chris that said, Chris Jones, question. but like we had like a thousand visitors coming in a yeah. year and it doesn't just look like receiving them on the bus and talking to them about right. what God's doing. It's plane flights, it's insurance, it's logistics. And sometimes right. it is. I got a lot of freedom from realizing that administration is in the same list as healing, as all the things Apostle that we prophet, want. Also prophet, teacher, evangelist, those were the gifts of administration, administration. those were the gifts of help. And I never, it, it never hit me until we went to Pemba yeah. and saw that and saw it actually be a move of the spirit because otherwise I'm just bogged down with work and just might as well do a nine to five anywhere and just yeah. sit in front of a computer. But when the spirit's on it, like it's easy. I'm able to talk to people through emails and touch them even through communication. And he makes it go faster, which is nice yeah. because then it's kind of the same thing. The spirit's moving. It's yeah. like, okay, Lord, I'll sit here in this process and do the admin, but like you also have to do it faster so I can be with my family yeah. and also have time to lay on the floor. And he really does show up. And I, when I released that and realized that, okay, admin is like, part of it it really helped a lot Come i think on. all you admin yeah. people out there don't feel it called. is a gift of the spirit <laughs> it, it is. is it really is. It yeah. is you can meet jesus at your computer and i do yeah <laughs> i love that so many people yeah. feel unusable because mm -hmm. they're they're their natural giftings that god's given them it doesn't line up with like oh, i'm gonna run out on the I'm streets preacher, and, right yeah and they and they feel lesser than and it's just garbage mm -hmm. god's just looking for obedience Right. I love that about you guys. Listen, I don't want to switch, but I uh, I know that I'm a little. Are, we we have a timeline today, yeah. and I want to get as much time with you. I want I wanted to pick your brain about some of the miracles you've seen, as well as some of the demonic and mm -hmm. the attack, and that is coming against. I, you you guys were telling me a story. I mean, you just got healed, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. and we were talking about it yesterday. Yeah, like the witchcraft. You're going into these new places mm -hmm. that don't have the gospel. Mm -hmm. And they're steeped in in 
the demonic mm-hmm. yeah and and ancestral worship what's that been like for you guys westerners <laughs> yeah um yeah i'll tell my story now i guess please my, my, whatever you want yeah so there's um in our yeah, in in a lot of villages, there'll be that witch doctor person, you know, traditional medicine man thing that's mixing, you know, medicine with spiritualism, and people can pay to have curses or or whatever. And so there's a tremendous amount of fear around that, and we do encounter it on regularly. Um, people that are are doing that or encountering that. Like I remember, um, man, years ago, I, I actually think it was when we just got to Pimba to do visitor center. I spoke no Portuguese. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could say hello. And Heidi kind of knew my face. And so we go on outreach into a village, and um, there's a harvest school team, and they're dividing the team up to go house to house, walk through the village, house to house minister. So they had a certain number of translators, and they Mm. were short a translator. So Heidi, recognizing my face as a missionary, looked at me and was like, you translate. He'd been on the field like a month. Okie (laughs) dokie. And so... (laughs) And so I get my little group of harvest school students and I turn around and say, guys, I'm so sorry to disappoint you. There will be no translation today. We, we are just going to walk around and pray. <laughs> We're going to prayer walk the village. And so that's what we did. And there was a little lady sitting outside of a house and, you know, we're kind of waving at her and we go, and she kind of motions for us to come over. So we go over and sit down and I'm like, well, this will be a conversation of charades. Yeah. Yeah. And for 20 minutes, the Lord gave me perfect Portuguese. And, she accepted the Lord. Got Explain that for people that just have no idea what you just said. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand it. I started, I opened my mouth to say something to her and yeah. Portuguese came out. I would say, Z- what is it? Zena, Zena, Glossolalia, right? It's yeah. the gift mm. of tongues. Mm. One of the aspects. Like, what languages. Must, yeah. yeah, what must I do to be saved, right? Yeah. It's the response. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it was, I mean, everything that needed to come out of my mouth came out of my mouth. And it was Portuguese the whole time. And I could understand her for, and speak to her and she got saved and i stood up to leave and the portuguese left <laughs> like left gone couldn't remember a word and kind of found out she was the witch doctor of the village and so it was an assignment i think from the lord for her for that day and i remember asking Supreza a few years later Supreza, because he's had this gift right yeah. language is common they stay and i said Supreza. i told him the story I was like how do you get him to stay <laughs> you know, <laughs> so the phrase starts laughing. He's like, "Oh, brother, you just gotta left rest into it." And I was like, "That is terrible advice." Yeah, I, that, know, uh, I have I no idea what that means. That. Yeah, yeah, thank <laughs> you. I have no idea what that means. Rest into but, it. Yeah, you know, I great. Next time, I'll try that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, in our local area, there's a particular lady um, that she's the queen of the village. Yeah. Everyone is terrified of her, and she does witchcraft stuff. And so we have a well drilling truck that came down and they did 15 wells, Mm -hmm. 15 wells. And when they were drilling the first one for the community, um, they got down about 25 meters and she came around and cursed the truck that would be stuck in the ground. And everybody watched, like she did this, everybody was watching the well get drilled and she came and the village watched this happen. Just paint a picture, queen of the village, Mm -hmm. right? So in a village there's leaders, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Yeah, there's, there's... Governmental leaders, yep. which would be like your chief and sub-chief mm-hmm. and secretary. And then they have more traditional leaders where yep. they'll sometimes call them the reina, like yeah, the, yeah. the queen of the village. It's it's ceremonial. Yep. She doesn't dress like a queen. She just dresses right, right, right. normally. But yeah. that, that's how they know her. This, you got one of your kiddos right, off yeah. camera, just so you know. People are wondering. What am I, hey, he, he's fine. Too. Just so you know. Like, he can do whatever whatever he wants. Okay? <laughs> so, he's such a cutie pie. He'll be over here soon. So, the, so, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> whatever. Hey, we don't mind. There was an episode where my dog was in here. So. <laughs> this is real life. Yeah. We have three kids on the mission field. Zero Comparison, though. like he's. My, I would rather have him. It will behave uh, the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listen, I think mine pooped on the floor, but anyway, and he's well. free to do that as well. Okay, uh, any you know. of your kids can do that. Um, so, the leader in the village, yeah, mm-hmm. right, and they they hold a level of authority. Right? Yes, they do. Yeah, very much so. I mean, they they hold very for for pe- villages that have a reindeer, They the villagers will honor her more than the chief. Yep, because she's you know the cultural ceremonial leader, and so. She came, her we were drilling, and came over and cursed the truck and said it'll be stuck in the ground. And sure enough, stuck in the ground, 25 meters down. We weren't there the day this happened. We just heard, hey, the truck is stuck. It's got a problem. We're waiting on a part. And we're like, okay. And so like a week and a half, two weeks into this, like, oh, by the way, Lorena came by and she cursed the truck. And I'm like, why did no one, why didn't we have this conversation two weeks ago? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
And so that was the day they, they were getting it fixed. Right. And as they took the rig out of the ground, it's 25 meters down. So about a, uh, 75 feet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 75 yeah. feet down in yeah. this little tube. After us right? praying yeah. for this yeah. to go away. And we were praying. And it came up and two black mambas came shooting out of the hole. And witch doctors, a lot of times, will use snakes. Like the most they dangerous use them all snake the time, yeah. in our area. You know, yeah. And they'll send them into churches. And, you know, so much of it's fear and intimidation. And they, and so. Come on. Yeah. There's so no natural the, explanation. Here's the crazy thing. Because some of you are like, oh, snakes crawled down the hole. No, like, yeah. and I asked you this. Because this is my stupid yeah. Massachusetts. <laughs> I don't believe anything. Uh, even though I do. It's just. Yeah. So, I, and I started the well drilling project in Mozambique. <laughs> I remember. Years yeah. ago. Oh, it, well, started. Is you went to India and bought the first Yeah, rig, I went right? to India and yeah. bought the rigs. So when you drill, right, you're going down, mm-hmm. you know, and it's what, a three, like four inch? Yeah, she yeah, big. The size, yeah. About the size Not of this. Big. Yeah. Yeah, goes down. And then you have a drill bit that, that is the size of that hole that's Correct. down there. Yeah. So it is. It's air. It's tight. It's moving. It's tight. And then it got stuck in there because things collapsed or something broke. But the snakes came out from underneath. Yes. Right. Which means that they had to be under there. Yes. The entire time. Yes. Which no snake would have survived. No. Under yeah, there. Crazy. No. It doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. No. Yeah. They came out. A- and we knew immediately, oh, that's what it is. It, and, it was part of that whole curse thing that she did. And snakes don't climb up straight. Like there's no way for no it It's a drill feet. bit. There's yeah. no way. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah it, yeah, it was crazy. It was super crazy. And these are... Black mamas, some of the most deadliest snakes. Yeah, in, in. yeah, they're the one you don't want to see. Yeah, you know, they come for you, kind of thing. Right. Yeah. yeah especially it's one of the only snakes that like chases after <laughs> yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, it's they crazy. Are, especially under the control of a witch doctor, they like yeah. to send them out and stuff. And so, uh, parallel this with, I had gotten malaria quite a bit the past year, and you know it was really weird because malaria, if you don't know, like comes like you start mm-hmm. getting sick and then get a little weirder and then you really get sick. Yeah. But I would go from. Zero percent to four, what they call cuatro cruzamentos. So it's like mm-hmm. the worst malaria you can have within about thirty minutes. I would go from feeling perfectly normal to being driven in the hospital, and this happened a couple times. And I was, I mean, like really, really sick. And I got where I was unbelievably exhausted. Mm. I would wake up in the morning, I would shower, and that was too much. And I would lay down for two, three hours. Almost the whole day sometimes. And maybe get up for an hour and have to lay back down. Like I told Jen at one point, I felt like I was collapsing in on myself. Mm. And there was, you know, they think maybe he got some autoimmunity or, you know, no one really, no one had a clue. And we're, you know, in Nicola and my brain isn't even working right. And I remember a few times thinking, this feels like maybe it might be a curse thing. I had a Mm -hmm. couple people message me. But like when you're that sick, your brain doesn't, like I couldn't like press, you couldn't figure it out or press into it. And it was getting worse and worse. And I would have, horrible pain all over my body. Like I remember one night writhing in the bed from Mm. pain. Like Mm. I never didn't even know you could hurt that bad. Mm. And this went on for three months. Two. Yeah. Yeah. Two months of just utter agony. What's going through your mind as this is going on? It was hard. It was really hard to watch. It was really hard to watch. We have three little kids. Right. And we had harvest school coming. Heidi and Roland were coming down. It was our big base opening. So of course it's very timely that he's struggling like the enemy is going to try to attack every way it was hard we had an amazing team that really helped a lot but it was a, it was a scary season because he started struggling to breathe and there's not good health care there the doctor even wrote a letter saying i can't help him please go to america go somewhere else wow we can't we can't help him here so he ended up getting on a plane that next day once he started getting to the point where he wasn't out of bed at all like un, unable to get out Time timeline. This mm-hmm. wasn't that this long was ago. Just, this, yeah, no, this was. Uh, I flew home December seventh. Seventh. Yeah. Or se- flew, you flew home the first. I flew the seventh. Yeah, I flew back early because we had stuff we had to finish up. So she's like, "Okay, I'll stay with the kids. You just go. We just get you to a hospital." So I arrived in Atlanta and Ubered, Ubered home, changed clothes, and then Ubered to the hospital. Mm. Like Ubered straight there, like checked myself in. It was like, please. I don't know what to do. Like, I, I can't walk. I can't function. Like, I mean, I, I was, I was like, am I dying? Like, yeah. You know, we scary. were ready to get, we had an oncology appointment set up. Wow. I mean, everything you could imagine, like we were, we were like no clue. And it, it felt really, really hopeless. Yeah. Cause none of the doctors could find anything. Everybody was like, oh, it's not this, try this. It's not this, try this. What were they leaning towards? Like in, they were leaning toward autoimmune disease. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's ultimately what they quote unquote diagnosed, right? They're like, we think it's autoimmune and where they really didn't know you're having a flare up. But it was, it was utterly, utterly debilitating in a way. Like, I couldn't even lift my hand above my yeah. head. Like, I would lay in bed, and I, like, I would be on my phone, but I would have to, like, have my phone on a pillow yeah. so that I could use it. Like, and that would exhaust me. Like, I couldn't breathe. 
like it was like laboring to breathe. I'd wake up in the morning and be like, like, yeah, so you can imagine watching Yeah, it that. was horrible. You know, it's hard. Yeah. You know, she felt like her husband's dying. Yeah. <laughs> you know, scary. and she's carrying the weight of the ministry, the weight of everything, the weight of our family and kids. And I mean, it was not easy. And we we had planned earlier, we'd kind of had a, a side conversation one time. We'd heard about this Jesus Image Conference. Yeah. And we didn't know anything about it. We just heard about it. And we were like, wanted to go. And Jen looks at me like a couple of days before the conference. It was December 17th-ish, mm-hmm. somewhere okay. in there. And she said, Do you, I think we should still go. And I was like, oh, man, really? <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. And, but we were so desperate. I was like, I looked at her, I was like, all I just want to do is lay in the presence of the Lord. I don't, you know, whatever. Yeah. Even if I don't get healed, let's just go love Jesus. Fine. Mm-hmm. And so we booked a flight down to Orlando. We booked the hotel closest to the conference center so yeah. I wouldn't have to walk far. And every morning I would struggle to walk from the hotel room. It wasn't far, a couple hundred yards. It's maximum. like attached to it. And I would, you know, she would sometimes like, I remember her grabbing my arm at one point to like help me. I like hold on to the side rail, like every step. And I would walk in the conference and just collapse into my chair. Couldn't stand for worship, sit there, listen to it. Couldn't sing. I couldn't, I couldn't even sing out loud because that was too much effort. And I didn't even go to the afternoon sessions. She went by herself. I would go back to the struggle to get back to the room and sleep three or four or five hours. I made it to one night session. The first one I didn't even go to. Yeah. Um, made it to one. The first one I went left, couldn't, couldn't do it. Second one I went to. And then the last night um, we went, and that was the hardest walk for whatever reason. Yeah. Like I honestly didn't think I was going to make it. We're like, I'm standing in the middle like this, this walkway thing. And I thought to myself, I cannot, I can't do it. But I forced myself to get over there, right, with every ounce I had. And as I walk in the door of it, they had a little table. And on it was those little snack pack communions, you mm-hmm. know, those oh, little, yeah. little crispies oh, yeah, on little the top. dippers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like, uh, <laughs> so I, I just had this thought go through my head. And I would never thought about it this way. And this thought was, I'm going to get healed during communion. And I didn't say anything to Jen. I just... This is my faith was like, you know, about that big, right? And so I took my little snack pack and I went to the chair. <laughs> I should not call it a snack oh, pack. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the little thing is, yeah, you know. I love it. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's the body in it. Yeah, yeah, it is the body. I'm talking about the, the yeah. form. Anyway, Very it's pretty much powerful. Love Please don't be offended, Sacramento. Yeah. Oh, you can be offended. You can offend. Yeah. And so I. The uh, point of it is how powerful it is. Yeah. <laughs> and so I went to my chair, collapsed into the chair like normal. Yeah. And we're sitting there in worship, and we had our, our nine-month-old baby with us, and he was not enjoying worship. So Jen had to take him to the back of the room to, like, let him scream and run on the ground, which is charismatic movement. Nobody's noticed. Yeah, nobody cares. But she took him to the back, and I'm there by myself. And um, Michael Koulianos was preaching. Yeah. And he, get, he gets up, and uh, not far into it, he said, some of y'all are going to be healed during communion. Kind of like a, just like an off comment. And when he said it, I, like, cocked my head, and I thought, hmm, Okay. Maybe, maybe this is, maybe there's something here. Mm. And he was preaching just an unbelievably beautiful message. Yeah. I mean, just the gospel just pours out of that guy, yeah, yeah. you know? And so yeah. he's, and I just was like loving the Lord sitting there. And I was like, I just want to lay before the Lord. So I got down on the floor between like, you know, the little aisle thing and the seats. And I, I'm just talking to the, listening to Michael, but praying, listening to Michael and just praying and just loving on Jesus. And um, they start doing communion. And I heard the Lord say, he became a curse for us. Audibly <laughs> in your heart. Um, describe that. Yeah, heart and mind. Okay. But I knew it was him. Yep. And when he said it, I saw these flashes of images of every time I kind of thought it might be a curse. And every little message I got that it was a curse. And I got off the floor and I stood up for worship. And worship was probably like an hour and a half, I think, at mm-hmm. that point. Stood up the whole time, sang my heart out. At the end, walked down to the front to greet somebody, and still hadn't said anything to Jennifer. <laughs> We're walking. Are back. you watching him start to like sing and walk? Yeah, I think it didn't connect to me at that yeah. point. It yeah. didn't really hit me until the next day when we're walking through the airport yeah. and he wasn't struggling and he walked all the way to the airplane. Right. And I mean, it's been three weeks now and yeah. he hasn't had one ounce of exhaustion, pain, completely healed, yeah. completely healed. Zero. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. No. Incredible. 
Yeah. I, you know, on the way back to the hotel that night, we're walking normally, yeah. normal human speed, mm-hmm. not, no longer like yeah, the yeah. tortoise that I was. Yeah. And I looked at her and I was like, babe, I don't know what to do with this. And I was telling her what I felt like happened. And she's looking, she's like, well, we're grabbing onto that. Mm. You know, that was like desperate mom. Like I ain't, you ain't dying. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah. well, well, can you just walk me through what you were praying? Like he gets sick. He's, mm-hmm. he's going down, right? It's not just him, right? Yeah. This is you. You pick up, you know, doing kids, ministry, mm-hmm. all of it, travel. Like it's right. chaos. Yeah. What, what's going through your heart as he's suffering through this? Do you have, a, uh. is the Lord speaking to you about, hey, this could be a curse, witchcraft, whatever it is? Um, I think more in that season, the Lord was just speaking to me about how much I need to rely on him. I think it was a season where I learned totally and utterly to rely on the Lord. Like we took, when Chris flew back, I had to take our three kids. I have a nine-month-old, a three-year-old, and a five-year-old on a 16-hour plane by myself. And I was like, how in the world can I even manage? I only have two hands. There's six hands between these little people. And the Lord's like, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And it was two months where I saw that every single day. Okay. Like his grace carried me through that, carried me through that airplane. The kids were angels, absolute angels. They loved it. They, they did amazing on that flight. Wow. And it, But it was moments like that every single day. Like the Lord showed up for me. Yeah. And it was um, especially my type A personality that we mm-hmm. talked about earlier. I couldn't do everything. Like I, I could not physically do everything that needed to happen during the day, host the harvest school, be there with Heidi and Roland. And God gave us, gave me just so much grace, so much grace. It was incredible. When my wife got sick, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think well, the first time eight years ago, nine years ago, the questions are why? What do mm-hmm. I need to do? What mm-hmm. do I need to change? Were you asking any of those questions? It sounds like you just went to like, I just trust you. <laughs> and you're great. Okay. If your grace is sufficient, then I'm, yeah. as your husband's falling apart. I do think, I think it was, um, I, I really feel like it was some, a season where he carried me mm. because I think if I would have tried to sit and process the why, like even now hearing like, <laughs> okay, we're Christians. Like, how does it work with the curse? And like, we're filled with the spirit mm-hmm. and like, where is this? And I don't really know theologically where those like how it can fit into that box. And I don't know if the why would have helped me. It was more like, this is the season that we're at. And either I can face it head on and just like give my all to the Lord, or I can kind of join Chris in the bed and just (laughs) wallow. But when you've got three kids, you can't. And so it's, yeah, I think we, it was a moment where I had to press in. And I think we're learning that time and time again with these things, like with the well drilling or with these churches that feel like we can't, we can't run fast enough to even, catch up with what the Lord is doing. Yeah. It's this, this tension of, I, I can't do anything. Like mm. it has to be the Lord. It has to be. But the only way I'm ready to receive that is if I spend my time with the Lord in the morning. For me, it was like driving the kids to and from school. Yep. Like I had to have those moments. Otherwise, then I felt like it was me trying to, right. trying to do it all. But if I gave myself that time to like be with him and rely on him and lean into him, that was the only way I could get through the days. And he really showed up. He was, he did, and he still does. Mm. But I think, um, yeah, watching Chris just be totally healed, I'm not even sure I know how to process it. Yeah. Like I said, theologically, or yeah. this is what we've experienced. Yeah. I don't know how it makes sense to everybody out there or what mm. you'll think listening to it, but this was our experience and what we've seen. But we've seen him be completely healed to this day. Yeah, not we were, anything. I mean, I we we've been a part of the journey on this side, right? Hearing, praying, staff mm-hmm. coming together, praying. Uh, our team fills us in. Oh, it's getting worse. Like we're we're hearing this stuff. We're praying. <laughs> I wish I could say I had this faith or this word of like it's witchcraft. Yeah, yeah. but we actually have people on our team that have experienced the mm-hmm. same thing. Uh, knowing now that you know that it's witchcraft, I know that you said you don't know where to fit that theologically. Mm. What what are your thoughts on it, Chris? You know, I. It was funny. I've not had that exhaustion again, but Mm -hmm. like the next week there were two moments where I felt the exhaustion start coming. Okay. And I literally just went spirit of infirmity go. And it was like (laughs) gone twice. It like tried it. Oh yeah. And it was amazing because I recognized it. Yeah. Recognized what it felt like. I knew who it was. And I was like, no, 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 you can't, we're not doing this again. Mm. And I don't, you know, I, I do think that the enemy hates Jesus. (laughs) Jesus. <laughs> and I think he hates the people of God. And I do think this, the, the spiritual realm is a very real thing. Yep. And it's, it is, as Paul says, a real war. Like we, we are, we are in a war, but not with people, right? Like we're not warring with flesh and blood. Yep. I'm not warring with the Rania of yep. Naharanki village. <laughs> I, I'm warring with the enemy of our souls, who is the enemy of her soul, whether she realizes it or not, mm. that is also wanting to destroy her. And so 
my goal when we get back to town is I just want to go to her house. Yeah. And I want to let her know how much I love her and how much Jesus loves her because I'm not at war with her. Mm. There's an enemy that tried to destroy me and I know is destroying, utterly destroying her. Yeah. Like I remember Heidi one time talking to a witch doctor that was so upset and had all these snakes. And all she said to him was, you have to be so tired. I was there. Yeah. In Mozambique yeah. With your mobile team. But I flew out that morning. Mm. So the team went. I missed it. By the way, if you want to watch that, if you're hearing this, you want to see what this actually looks like in person. Yeah. We have a, this video that Chris just uh, mentioned. And if you go to our YouTube channel, which you're on right now, uh, and and search um, which doctor gets saved, I think that's it. Which yeah, it's on the testimonies playlist, uh, but it's also if you which doc which doctor gets saved, uh, you'll see the snakes. Mm-hmm. You'll see the yeah. one of these stories take place. It's an amazing video. Yeah, it's and so like even Jose, like that was right. the guy, like to this day, like loves Jesus. Yep. We, we've been back to that village, hung out with him. Yep. like it's it's an amazing story. Definitely watch it. But it's so easy to vilify this Reina. It's totally very easy to just be like, oh, that woman, you right. know. But sure, she allowed herself, whatever. But this woman is under the curse of the enemy. Right. Is being, has to be utterly tortured by him. Has to be exhausted to be. in every possible way. And so the only response I feel like I have is deep compassion. Because if I felt exhausted in the way that I'm feeling, the spiritual forces that have to be wrecking her mm. is heartbreaking. Yeah. Like, and you think about like, if he hated me and the little work we're doing, like how much does he hate her and the destiny God has for right, her right. as the leader of this village that could help turn this whole village to the Lord. And so all I'm seeing and praying for is the opportunity to go and be like, Hey, let me, let me just tell you what happened to me. Mm. We're not vilified. Let me just tell you yeah. what God did for me. Um, the story when the, the video or the YouTube video, yeah. um, Heidi said to him, like, you must be so tired. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. That's all like, she that said. was actually all, all she said to him. Yeah. And he was like, I am. Yeah. And then his girlfriend who had uh, leprosy. leprosy. Yeah. His girlfriend's like, he doesn't sleep. Like, <laughs> I'm sick of sleping next to snakes at night. Snakes, right. Yeah, it was like, yeah. it was so funny because you had this like really house. like spiritual, like he's there with snakes. Like, ah. <laughs> and then the girlfriend's like, listen, I freaking don't like sleeping with, like around snakes. And I don't sleep, and he doesn't sleep, <laughs> and it was like it was. It just took this little like this girlfriend to be like, <laughs> get him out of the yeah, house. Yeah, just kind of open up the back door and be like, this is actually what it looks like. He's like, she's like, my house is dark. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. so because they're people. Right. They're just people. They're people. Yeah. You know, people get especially when you start telling them like, oh, let me tell about the witch. Right, right, right. I said, yeah, but it's just a guy. It's just a dude. It's just a dude that, that has a girlfriend, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. a girlfriend. and he snakes. really likes her. Yeah. Like yeah. he actually, yeah. like there's a piece of him that really likes her yeah. and loves her and wants to take care of her. Yeah. He's they're just, married now. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. But yeah, it's, it's like, they're just people that just need him. Yeah. You know, and obviously they have some kind of interaction with the spirit realm and all this. I just think, what could God do? Yeah. You know, like what could the Lord do? And well, what, what is he going to do? What's next he going to do? Right. Yeah. What's he going to do next week? We're yeah. gonna rock up to her house. <laughs> Dude, I can't wait. Yeah, Make that's sure. the thing. Like the enemy's overplayed his hand. Like now we're very aware of the Rania. Yeah. We were we're we aware, man. Dude, you know what strap I mean? a like, GoPro. Now. Strap exactly. a GoPro to your chest, man. We'll hopefully we'll try to include some of that footage. Yeah. No, it's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's amazing. What, what other, <laughs> I love it. I, I love it. What other, I mean, I feel like I don't even want to stop this. <laughs> I just want to keep hearing from you about <laughs> what you guys are doing. Like I, no, <laughs> whatever. We got a little bit of time. <laughs> what else are you seeing the Lord do uh, in in the unreached? I there is a guy named Genesis. His name is Genesis. He changed it when he got saved. Yeah. He was from, he was a front Muslim family, got saved, got kicked out of his house. And he um, just loved Jesus, wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. And he, uh, <laughs> he didn't have any money to go like out into the village, but he really had a heart for it. And he met this Brazilian guy that was also a believer, happened to be a contractor in Dakala. And the guy gave him a little money to go out and plant, like minister. And he mm-hmm. started planting all these churches. I think he planted 10 churches. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, because people are hungry for Jesus, right? And yeah. so he's just going out, one of the very few people going out fully evangelizing, sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel. And, you know, he didn't have the proper government documents that the government's like, you can't do that anymore, right. or so on and so forth. And the Brazilian guy happened to go back to Brazil for a family thing and went to a conference, saw Heidi there, and heard about Iris. Yeah. So he comes back to Mozambique, he's like, is Iris here? And so he starts looking around, looking around, couldn't find any Irish people in Nicala because prior to us arriving, there wasn't any. Right. And someone told him, hey, there's a little church we think might be Iris, and it's over in this village. It's one of the ones, we, the first ones we planted. And so he just drives by faith like 40 minutes, comes over, finds our little church, became cool friends with us, whatever. And him and Genesis like kind of come into the fold, yeah. and we adopt those, these 10 churches. And so we, we, we went out in the village and like met with all of them and like none of them had pastors. They all have like little mud buildings with like these barely yeah. thatched roofs, yeah. you know, like, but people just absolutely in love with Jesus. And so now they're all like, you know, the kind of these adopted Irish churches that felt totally alone. And they keep telling oh. us, oh, we felt so alone. Wow. Nobody was helping us. We couldn't. And like watching Genesis, this guy like on fire for Jesus, like everywhere he goes, people find the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, you know, that natural evangelistic gift, you know, yep. I don't even think he knows he has it kind of a thing. It just happens. Yeah. But like watching, I think for me, and I love miracles, I, mm -hmm. I, I, sign me up. I want to see all the miracles I can see. But the thing that is just blowing me away right now is the pure love of Jesus that we're seeing mm -hmm. among the unreached. Um, mm -hmm. And that is just a treasure because I've seen people get healed or yep. that don't want him afterwards. Yep. You know, like there's, a lot of people, you know, Roland will tell you, a lot of people have been raised from the dead and those are big and afterwards don't want him. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a crazy story that we've heard more than once, mm -hmm. which blows people's minds. Yeah, how It could, blows my mind. How could you not, yeah. right? Yeah. But these, it's seeing that absolute pure love of Jesus and that response to the gospel has been mm -hmm. so beautiful. Wow. And I think when I was a younger guy, like I wanted to see all the miracles I could see, you yep. know, and I remember, man, um, when I was a student at Harvest School, I went down to the beach one morning and there was a guy there that I, you know, I don't, he was like on crutches or something and I didn't have any Portuguese, but I kind of motioned, could I pray for you? <laughs> and all the, like the Muslim fishermen are sitting there like watching yeah. and I go pray for him and I'm like pouring my heart out yeah. and he doesn't get healed. And the Muslim fishermen are kind of laughing, mocking me and whatever. And I'm standing there on the beach very angry at God. I was like, Lord, you missed an opportunity here. Had you healed this guy, all these guys probably would have gotten saved. All right, I'm not proud of this, but this is what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> very upset. Like, Lord, I stepped out in faith. All these people are telling me that if I'll step out in faith, right. you'll show up. Right? Yeah. You didn't show up. Yeah. I'm in the land of revival. Heidi's, mm. you know, it's like. Right, exactly. Yeah, easiest place yeah. for a miracle, yeah. right? Yeah. And I heard the Lord say to me, he's like, it's your job to love, my job to heal. Mm. And I was like, that is a very unsatisfactory answer. And so I went back to the base, didn't say anything. And that particular day, Heidi was teaching the school. And at the end of the message, um, she was up at, the, up at the front laying down praying and kind of doing stuff in the mic. And then she goes, I just hear the Lord saying, <laughs> it's my job <laughs> to heal, your job to love. And for 20 minutes, that's all she said. And it just settled deep into my heart that like, it is not my job to go out and get all the miracles I can get. That's up to him. I can't do a single thing with this hand. Mm. My only job is to share the absolute love of Jesus. And if he wants to heal, if he wants to show up, hallelujah, we'll take all we can get more. But I think like I find myself so obsessed with that. Mm -hmm. And I asked Roland one time, I was reading a book called How to Get the Anointing by A.A. Allen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. And Roland is walking in front of me. We're in Malawi. He's walking in front of me. We barely, I barely knew him. And uh, they just by happen chance let me come to Malawi with them. And, uh, and I was like, this is my chance to ask Roland a theological question. Right. I said, Roland. He turns around. How do you get the anointing? And he looks at me and he goes, that's the last thing on earth you should worry about. Go get a pure heart. He just turns around and walks away. And for four years, yeah, that good. was my so obsessive good. prayer. Mm -hmm. Is I just want a pure heart. Mm. I want my motivations to be pure. I want the purity of heart about every encounter I have, what I want him to do. And it has dramatically changed what I see as a win. Hmm. Where before the wins were, well, I've got to see this many of this or this or this. And I, again, love them. They're great. But that Roland was dead on in that moment. Hmm. 
it's not that we shouldn't pursue the gifts. The Bible is really clear. Pursue the gifts. That's fine. But what's the motivation for that pursuit? Yeah. And that's the thing that I think is really crucial, especially for a lot of us charismatic folks, is not the pursuit of power for power's sake, but for that pure love of Jesus and how he can pour that out on a people. You know, like, do I love them? enough that I want a healing for this guy because I want the love of Jesus or I just want to put a notch in the belt and be like, got a testimony, yeah. you know? And that's, I think that's what we want. And we just want pure love of Jesus. And so when I say that about like the people of Nicola, like I really mean it. And I think that's a joy to me that I mean it, you know, because mm. I wouldn't have meant it 10 years ago. It'd have been a cool thing to say, but I really mean it. Like the greatest thing to me is that pure love of Jesus that I see in guys like Manuel that I mentioned yeah. earlier, or Genesis, or I could list all these young men and women that love him. <laughs> and there's nothing better in this whole world than just loving him. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, we're just so grateful. <laughs> Very grateful. It, uh, it sounds so simple. <laughs> it is. Right? And I used to sit there and I'd listen to Heidi and Rollins and I'd, mm-hmm. and I, and I'd hear them share these things like what you are both sharing, right? With pure heart and stop for the one. And, um, you know, our core values, we have mm-hmm. the ability not just to seek God, but to find him. And it, we gain everything in that place. Mm-hmm. And then we very quickly, it moves on to, okay, but then the next, what's the five step? How could you heal people without the five step prayer model? Yeah. Right? Because we need yeah. these steps. We need mm-hmm. these systems. Why? What were some of the things in your heart that weren't pure, if you don't mind, that you had to, <laughs> that you had to, that you faced during those four years? Like what was some of the things that you felt leave? Mm. What were some of the things you felt lift? Yeah. That were, that were a hindrance. And I'd love to hear mm. this from, from you as well. I could tell you all about his things. Yeah, but actually, <laughs> what were some of the things that you yeah. saw change in Chris? What did you see? Yeah, yeah. actually, it's a better actually, question. No, a better he question. did. He, I mean, when he first went to harvest school, he came back a different person. Like, you came back after having an encounter with the Lord. You came back kind. I love you. I'm a very great guy. <laughs> but you came back kind. The kindness of the Lord was marked on your life. It was a difference. But what was the name of the book that you were praying through at that time? Uh, in the Name of Jesus the name by of Henry Nowen. Yeah. It's a it's a little short book. It might be seventy pages, um, and Henry Nowen goes through the temptations of Jesus and he relates them to ministry. Mm. Um, I'm going to mess it up right now. The desire to be powerful, yep. the desire to be spectacular, yep. and the third one I can never remember. To know, to be known, to be known. And for me, honestly, those three things were huge in my heart. Um, I I wanted to be known and seen and recognized. Um, so one of the prayers in that time became Lord, make me a prophet in the dirt. Mm. Like if you want to put a prophetic gifting on me, if you just want me to prophesy in an unknown random village, thank you. Years before this, we, we worked in Kenya. We have another nonprofit that we run in Kenya. And I was standing in a village one day making all these grandiose plans to expand the ministry. <laughs> and the Lord spoke to me and he said, would this one village be enough for you? Hmm. And it wasn't a question of like, um, are you not hungry enough? Right. He was asking like, is your pride okay yeah. if I just called you here? And I answered him honestly. I was like, no. And at the time, I didn't realize how unholy that answer was. But he was asking me to drop Christopher's pride <laughs> and do whatever he wanted to do. Mm. And so desire to be known was a huge one. Um Performance and perfection. To this day, I still pray about performance and perfection. Um, because perfection, I think, really a lot of times held me back from openness and vulnerability in front of other people. Mm-hmm. Because I had to be perfect and present to you a perfect person and con- control, really, what you saw and when you saw it. And it, it really, I think, hurt me in a deeper way than I realized. And performance, on the other hand, of like like wanting to be like the guy Mm. and you to see me do the stuff or or whatever. Did you see that stuff in him, Jen? (laughs) No, yes. Yeah, but I mean, in myself too, I think that's a temptation. Um, Even in in the charismatic, we have an amazing 
leaders and we see incredible people with incredible testimonies and there's this desire, oh, I want to be like that. Or, or maybe even if I'm not like that, I will have arrived spiritually, like almost a spiritual validation. Like I will have arrived spiritually when I lay hands on the sick and they're healed. Then I'll know that mine was more like an approval from God. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, I've done my good spiritual discipleship or Bible study. And then Okay, when I start feeling seeing healings or seeing their dead raised, okay, now I'm a good Christian. Okay, <laughs> right. now yeah. God, I've arrived. Right. now I've arrived, <laughs> right. and then they'll start asking me to speak yeah. because they'll see like, oh, <laughs> I've got this approval from God, and now you've yeah. got this platform. Yeah. And um, I think that really had to be it was a me and God thing more than a me and man thing about like how I understood God's love for me, God's acceptance of me, um, what my ministry was supposed to look like. Mm. once I like kind of whittled it down and took away all this stuff and realized like he just wants me and there's not any level of approval or non-approval. And while you can't gain more, like you learn more from him in your time with him, but it's not like a uh, both and like, right. okay, if I do two hours today, then when I lay hands on the sick, they'll get healed. It's a posture of the heart. And I mm. think I had to change that mindset. That's more what he's been working on with yeah. me. Yeah. That and judgment. Judgment was a big thing for me. <laughs> it's hard when you look at leaders and say, oh, I'll never do that. Oh, I'll never be like that. Oh, or, oh I'm not going to be like that. Making those, changing those things in my heart to learning to pray for my leadership and really not you guys, other like around any leader in general. I mean, we've been in missions. Like yeah. I went and started 2009 2008 I mean I've done missions trips ever since I was in middle school I've always known I want to be a missionary so we've been on a lot of missions trips seen a lot of missions short-term missions so it's really hard not to judge yeah it's hard to to learn from situations without having that judgment and I think God took me through a journey of really like learning to humbly pray for people Mm -hmm. and realize like I am like absolutely nothing and the more i judge the more it's going to come back on me you know what i mean like yeah. i would so much rather just be nothing so that was a big thing for me there was a as i was i was at a conference a few weeks ago and i took some notes but as you guys were talking um i went through i took some notes on, i was reading first john so uh i don't want to take too much time it says i write to you dear children because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name, I write to you fathers because you've known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. Then he goes on to say, I write to you children because you've known the father. I write to you fathers because you've known him who is from the beginning. And I write to you young men because you're strong and the word of God lives in you. And mm. I just see these phases of our lives, right? Mm, mm-hmm. Right? When you're a child, right? And you have zeal. It's like mm-hmm. you're strong. You know the word. Like you're mm-hmm. learning to know the word. And your sins have been forgiven. And then you switch into... Uh, yeah, to um, young men, right? And then what I love about this, this says about fathers, right? The, the, the older generation, the one that's been walking with it says, you've known him who's from the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. Like you know all of him <laughs> from, mm-hmm. from, from the beginning up until now. Mm. And as I was listening to you, man, it just popped back into my heart. But I think that, this journey, if you let him, right, mm-hmm. that, that starting off as I'm in Bible school and I'm hearing God give me this one and I want to do missions and go and preach and teach and be the prophet, mm-hmm. you know, or whatever. And we, we're, sp- I think it's a beautiful thing to have zeal. Right. And yeah. it's a beautiful thing to be ambitious for God. Sure. Mm-hmm. And then you go through this process of stripping the sickness, the overcoming, the, mm-hmm. the planning churches, the seeing churches fit, like all of it, all of it, if you let your heart, right? Pure heart. Yeah. Be developed into a pure heart. You actually know him who's from the beginning. Mm. And you guys, I love this journey mm. that you're on. Thanks. And please don't ever leave us. <laughs> we love you guys. <laughs> or We're not going me. anywhere. Uh, <laughs> don't. Please don't. We love it. Uh, I, I, I love what God's doing in Nicola. Mm. And what I love, even as we were talking before we got on, is, you know, you're like, we know that this is timing, but if God calls us somewhere else, like you guys have been, I've watched you over the years be just incredibly obedient. Mm. And, uh, yeah, if you ever want my job, <laughs> oh, thank yeah, you. it's no, all yours. Bless okay. you and pray Absolutely. for you all the time. You will do a much better job than I will. I really, I really love you guys. Take the dirt. Yeah. Um, thank really you. quick, if people want to get in touch with you, here's one thing that I don't want you to do because we get a lot of this stuff. Whenever you talk about demons, people are like, ooh, I have a question, right? Uh, and they're like, will you pray for me? Like, yeah. these guys are out preaching the gospel. Find someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, but. No, we'll talk. <laughs> I know you will. But the internet gets weird. 
and this is up on the internet. Yeah, do right, and they want. Yeah, do <laughs> they I mean, want? No longer has social media, so that's okay. I, don't <laughs> even, makes it easy. I do oh, really? have an Instagram. I rarely log in, but yeah. Okay, well, that was my next thing. How yeah. can people get in touch with you? I think there's an email on the Iris website, right? I Chris think. at irisglobal.org. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> Chris <laughs> Jennifer Hadsel at irisglobal.org. Yeah. He's Chris at irisglobal.org. Okay, I'm pretty sure if they go to Iris Global, they can choose Nicola as a base. Yeah, it'll send like a, a general link email. to us. Yeah. Do you yeah. have any other social media? People can follow you. Keep the up to date. Iris what's going Nicola on. Oh, is, is on Instagram. Nicola. Really? Yes. Yeah. Iris okay. Nicola on Instagram. Yeah. Our lovely missionary Melissa handles that for us. Oh, thank. Shout out to Melissa. Shout out Melissa. Shout out to Melissa. <laughs> Let's go, Melissa. If you want to see more pictures of our kids, Chris Hadsel. Yeah, yeah, you can. I do post okay. on Instagram. Yeah. Send out my children. Yeah. yeah. And occasionally other stuff. Yeah. Come on. So, uh, is there anything you guys need right now? You're not allowed to. I mean, I know you guys are not asking for this. This isn't a conversation. Is there something? I know you mentioned solar Bibles. Yeah. Is there anything else that you're, mm -hmm. I'm like, I feel like I'm broaching Iris territory, but you're not asking. No. This is the green room and I can do whatever I want yeah. on it. But is there anything that's like big dream on your heart right now? Mm -hmm. uh, for Nicole, I think there's two. Oh. Well, I think that's wrap. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> gotta go. Bro, I could care less. <laughs> we gotta go. No. <laughs> Man, did you bring your witchcraft out here? We should not with, be with, talking about the heck? <laughs> <laughs> That's the second time that's happened. Yeah. When was the first time? I can't tell. Uh, I can't tell you on on camera. Over. Oh, the episode isn't over. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Is there anything else you guys need? Uh, uh, church building. Our yeah. our churches okay. are growing, and like we said, yeah, they're under. Swarm. Yeah, it's yeah. rainy season. They are under bushes. They are under trees. They are mud huts that keep getting built and falling down because it's rainy season. So yeah. just pray for the churches, and they need it. Yeah. Something Come about on. having a building and meeting together with believers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, out of the rain. I mean, it sounds yeah. like. I don't know. I don't think people understand. Like when the rains come in Africa, yeah. like the crazy monsoons, it's like crazy. When people that are meeting on a mango tree, like it's almost impossible. Yeah, you know they'll do it if the weather's okay. But I mean, you yeah. can't expect somebody. You know, so we really need at least roofs for our churches. Awesome. Mostly that we really encourage them to do what they can. So a lot of them are building like mud buildings. We want that investment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but roofs are way beyond their yeah. their financial ability. And then. The other piece for us is there's a we have a, a worship center that mm -hmm. we have built um, for Iris, for Iris missionaries, yeah. for Mozambican leaders and things like that. But there's a piece of land beside it that's we really feel the Lord on, and so yeah. just believing Him for that. What? Okay, uh, that's code word. Uh, code word. We're believing Him for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're believing Him for the money yeah. to buy it. Just connect with these guys. If anybody's watching yeah. this, and you feel a, a pull. Um, or just want to just connect with these guys, yeah. and we'll we'll chuck your information down there. Uh -huh. uh, what if do you do you guys take any visitors? We do. We you just do? opened. We had our first harvest school group in November, oh. um, so we are starting to. It's a lot smaller than the Pemba Visitor Center is. So okay. There's only like 20 beds, so it's not a bunch. But we are starting to learn what it looks like to receive people, come to Nicola, see what God is doing, receive from Him. It's a beautiful space. It's a safe space. We have a gorgeous nice. prayer room. Gorgeous prayer Define room. Define safe. You just talked about black mambas and well, Chris almost dying we are only and six war, hours war south. zone. Yeah, so. we're coming from the war zone of Pemba. Yeah. yeah so, so yeah, it's south. safe. I mean, it is. It, it's you know, it's it's safe. We have guards on the base or Mozambique whatever. The petty theft would be the worst possible thing. It's also one of the most beautiful. It's gorgeous. I, I, we won't even talk about that. Very yeah, it's, blessed. It's right on the beach. But you can have your cake and eat it too. You, you can, can receive yeah. the Lord <laughs> as you see the ocean. It's, it's, That's it's true. stunning. So please come it to is. visit. Yeah. Yeah. The Lord really blessed us. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming on. I love you massive. I, we could keep going, but I do need to hit the road. And I think you guys are hitting the road mm -hmm. again we today. Are, yeah. I'm going to go pack and head back to Africa. Yep. Yeah. And so by the time you... You guys are watching this. Uh, they'll be in Mozambique, and I can't wait to hear uh, the story of what happens with the yeah, with the witch pray. doctor. <laughs> yeah, please pray, and that's really the biggest thing people can yeah. do is pray. Yep. Because yeah, yeah, as yeah. we've said, you know, it's a spiritual battle that we're in. Yep. So the more people that are praying, like Chris felt it incredibly much, so much so that when my kids were sick last week, Chris didn't even get sick with a cold. Like wow. prayer is really really helping. So, so please pray. Pray for these guys. Listen, I know as you guys are watching this, you love the guests. Uh, but honestly, the, one of the main reasons why I do this podcast is to turn your attention to what God's doing mm -hmm. in Iris around the world. And and I I know that all of you that have made it through this far, like God's doing a deep work in your heart. He's calling you. Yeah. If you want to connect, go to our website. You can connect to these guys. You connect to one of our schools that they went to. You can just connect, just connect. There's a tribe of like-minded, like-hearted people out there doing this stuff. 
And I, as you were sharing, and I never do this, but I felt like I really, not on this podcast, but I felt like there was a lot of missionaries that were burnt out, that you, you went through it for years. You served in nations and you're burnt out. And I would encourage you to reach out to Mm -hmm. these guys. I would encourage you, um, get Heidi's book, get Rollins book. Um, and there's, there's more for you and you're not done. You're not done. Amen. Yeah. And, and if you're Wycliffe. We're so grateful, oh, man. I believe Lisa. Yeah, if you're, yeah, we're so we wouldn't be doing what we do in Iris without you guys. No, nope, that's the truth. Yeah. Anything else? Any last words? Nope. Going that's once. <laughs> Thank you. Going Thanks. twice. Thanks for having us. I love you guys. <laughs> we're very. I honored. love you guys. Thank you. I feel like you could it. do this so much better than I could. Uh, <laughs> even even this, like okay, you, bye. yeah. I just love you guys massively. Tons of respect. Thank you. Uh, Goes guys, both ways. Thank you. like, subscribe, follow these guys, do all the things, throw a comment in there because it helps. There's algorithm, algorithm, <laughs> there's <laughs> algos, algorithms and things. And, uh, we'll see you in the next, uh, Irish global green room. Bless you guys. Thanks for doing these podcasts.